The Hornet 1 Type CC, a redesigned version of the Hornet MK1 controllable variant with a recoverable low film camera attached to the overall payload. This will hopefully give us more scientific data as well as funding. On February 7th, 1953, the new CC variant was rolled out to the pad and prepped for ignition. Due to the proven reliability of the Hornet series rockets, the team was hopeful for the success of this mission as well. Aiming to hit at least the Karman line and make it roughly 200 meters downrange, the team knew that this rocket was not only capable of this challenge, but able to far exceed it. With all checks finalized, the ignition sequence was started, and the new Hornet variant set off to the skies. The hope was to get it up to a certain level and detach the probe from the rest of the rocket, and hopefully keep the camera stable enough to achieve aerial photos from space. Using this lower tech, they were hopeful that they'd be able to recover something after the re-entry. Only being on a suborbital return, they hoped that the camera could withstand the reheating effects from coming back through the atmosphere at such high speeds. Like previous Hornet launches before, it managed to burn the full 61 seconds of fuel, placing it on a suborbital trajectory that was gonna hit roughly 290 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Estimating at least 490 meters downrange, the team was waiting to see how far the probe could actually make it. Unfortunately, due to some aerodynamic instability, the rocket started to turn sideways. A brief panic set in as the payload was released early as soon as the rocket was facing a forward direction. With confirmation of separation, the team sat back and waited for the payload, hopefully to survive re-entry back to the waters of Earth. Ground crews could see a ball of plasma falling through the sky. As the temperature reading started to climb, the team was hopeful the probe could survive the re-entry. The parachute was armed as it came piercing through the thicker parts of the atmosphere. Using binoculars, the recovery team was able to see that the probe, in fact, was still intact as the boats moved towards the predicted landing zone, approximately 509 meters downrange. As the parachute started to deploy, the team sat back and waited for it to land in the water where they would scoop it up and take it back to the center for further observation. Once back at the KSC, the team was able to review the footage and see breathtaking photos from low above the Earth's surface and piercing into space, as well as interesting shots of the plasma that formed around the camera during re-entry. All of these would be used for further safety measures for human flight. With the second task for the Sparrow Project completed, the team moved on to the final task before finally sending a human somewhat into the skies using rocket propulsed planes. Using the same formula, the Hornet MK-1B was born, a biological sample version of the Hornet rocket. This was used to determine the effects on biological samples of breaking the sound barrier and piercing the lower atmosphere. Using a non-controlled core and spin stability, the goal was to launch this as high as we could in the sky and hopefully recover it as it came back down through the atmosphere. It was on April 30th, 1953, when the rocket was rolled out to the pad and igniting, letting out a thunderous roar as it took to the sky. The team noticed the spin stability kicked in just as they hoped for as the rocket projected on a straight up course. Wanting to hit at least 250 kilometers above the surface, the team knew this rocket was more than capable of it. The capsule containing fruit flies was closely monitored to see the effects of the increasing G-forces as well as what will happen once it reaches out of the atmosphere. The rocket itself was an overall success as it reached up to roughly 388 kilometers at roughly 4 minutes and 54 seconds and the fruit flies were still showing signs of life during this time. At the five and a half minute mark, the payload was detached from the rest of the rocket to hopefully survive re-entry, coming back through at high speeds and a mostly vertical trajectory. The rocket was, however, given a slight downrange angle to help with re-entry purposes from stuff we learned from previous launches. The team monitored re-entry heating as close as possible. As the plasma started to build up around the capsule, temperatures did spike, but it looked like the core overall was going to survive the re-entry. The specialized cage designed to protect the biological samples seemed to be a success. Now all we had to do was hope the parachute would deploy and land safely. While looking to the sky, they were able to see the stripes of the parachute start the deployment, and the team relaxed a little bit 
as the probe came slowly falling back down to Earth. With full deployment of the parachute, the team knew everything was going to be okay, as the probe should softly land on the water, where it will be recovered and taken back to the KSC for further examination. This would be the last bit of data we needed to send a human up into the skies and beyond the sound barrier. With yet another success under their belts, the team sat back and rejoiced as all eyes were focused on the space plane hangar where the new X-01 was being rolled out for final inspection. Kat Nizkin, Polish pilot who immigrated with his mother after his father was tragically killed in World War II as he was fighting with the United States Air Force as an ally. Because of the family background, Kat Nizkin was drafted as an early test pilot for NSAC. Wanting only to follow in the footsteps of his father, Kat was the first to step up to the plate for Project Sparrow. Initially, the agency wanted to test this without a pilot, but Kat would not have that. With pride on his side, he was willing to risk life and safety to be the first person to ever fly a rocket-propelled X-plane. The Sparrow MK-1, or the new flagship X-Plane, or also known as Experimental Plane, will be taken to the skies in a few days after it's thoroughly checked through for all safety features. Equipped with an ejectable cockpit for worst case scenario situations, she was fueled up and loaded on to the aircraft carrier to be air launched roughly 140 kilometers away from the center. The Sparrow X-01 sat at approximately 6.2 tons at a height of 3 meters, a width of 4.7, and an overall length of 8.5 meters. With approximately 261 seconds of burn time on the XLR-11, outputting roughly 1800 meters a second in total delta V, the X-01 was designed to push the sound barrier, and possibly even further. In today's experiment, we need to see how the wing stability profile is, as well as the reliability of the XLR engine, and the safety of the pilot. Chat, we have a report of a failed ignition. Can you please confirm? Yes, we had a failed ignition. Failed ignition confirmed. Please go ahead and perform abort sequences. Boats are on their way. Sorry guys, no can do. I'm gonna light her up again. There's no time like the present. I'll see you on the runway. No abort. Chat, abort. After burning most of the field, the rest of it was dumped as the team realized that Cat had overshot the runway. The team knew that Cat would have to make an emergency U-turn, something the plane was not quite designed for. The next thing they knew, the plane started spinning out of control and started ripping itself apart. At this point, the team had regained control of the craft and initiated the abort sequence. Hopefully the capsule and the parachute would be able to survive the mayhem happening in the sky. As they saw the chute open, they were hopeful. Even though Cat had directly disobeyed orders, 
He had successfully broken the sound barrier and managed to achieve all contract parameters, thus giving more funding, hopefully to replace a plane that he may get to fly again. As Cat tumbled down to the surface, all he could think was, I would do it again. Unfortunately, the craft was lost, but plenty of data was gained in its place. Katniss has been suspended until further notice, until the oversight committee can make a final judgment. We learned a lot from today's flight, but was the knowledge really worth the risk? With this in mind, the team started making slight adjustments to draft a second version of the MK1 to hopefully fly later this year or sometime early 1954. On June 31st, a secondary drafted Hornet 1 was rolled out to the launch pad for yet another downrange contract attempt, this time hoping to reach roughly 390 meters downrange and an altitude of over 140 kilometers, something the team knew the rocket could easily accomplish. Deciding to try a new flight plan to see if it would increase yields from the rocket, the team was hopeful they could at least complete the contract if something were to go wrong. So far, the Hornet series rocket has had an incredible track record. So when the engine ignited and sent off to the skies, the team was hopeful that yet again they could achieve their goals. This particular flight plan was actually aiming to get a little more altitude out before going more downrange in hopes that being higher in the atmosphere would decrease drag and allow us to go further in a downrange trajectory. Thus being a suborbital flight, they needed to make sure the probe could also safely re-enter. Even though it's not part of the contract, the team would still like to recover the probe to do further research. As with previous flights, the rocket managed to burn through all 61 seconds of fuel as it soared to an altitude roughly 288 kilometers above the surface, where the payload was separated from the rest of the rocket to be prepped for re-entry. Needing to reach at least 390 meters downrange, the team was hopeful with the current trajectory they could at least achieve that. All signs were nominal as the flight continued without a problem. Like with previous flights, the probe came back through the atmosphere, building up a ring of plasma, but surviving the re-entry. Everything intact, all we had to do was hope for the parachute to deploy so the recovery teams could sweep it up out of the ocean to bring it back for further scientific research. As the rocket barely managed to do the contract by hitting 391.4 meters downrange, the new flight plan was scrapped and will be changed for future flights. The contract being successful did, however, cut it close. New adjustments will be made to the Hornet 1 rocket for future launches. As the successful splashdown happened, the recovery teams swooped it out of the water and brought it back. Yet again, another success. With only enough time for one more launch, the team quickly got to work to roll out the next Hornet variant to secure more funding and to attempt to get more shots from the upper atmosphere using the low-res camera. It was on October 29th when the CC variant was rolled out to the pad and prepped for launch. The ultimate goal was to reach at least 400 meters downrange and exceed 140 meters above the surface. Our goals, however, were to hit at least 250 kilometers above the surface as well as get 450 to 500 meters downrange. The rocket was rolled out to the pad and ignited, and like so many times before, it let out a thunderous roar and took to the skies. This rocket also using a slightly varied flight path, the team did not make such extreme corrections like before due to issues from the previous launch. Once again achieving to burn through all of its fuel reserves, the engine was ignited and burned for 61 seconds as it soared on a trajectory at roughly 292 kilometers above the surface with a predicted downrange path of 435 meters. Not quite what the team wanted, but enough to complete all contact parameters as well as get the photos they desired for further scientific research. At approximately three and a half minutes into the flight, the payload was detached and telemetry showed that the camera started to spin or roll in the upper atmosphere. Hoping this wouldn't degrade the photos too much, the team pressed on, taking a photo every two seconds, hoping to get some reliable data from this launch. As the probe drifted through its suborbital trajectory, ground crews had started to send boats to the predicted path to recover the camera as soon as possible. Once again surviving the re-entry, the team was hopeful that the plasma wouldn't degrade the film too much as some photos were lost in the previous launch. 
experiencing high g-forces as well as temperatures a little higher than the team was hoping for they found out that it actually made it roughly 457 meters downrange farther than the predicted path but not as good as the launch previous the original flight plan will possibly be used in future launches unless upgrades are deemed necessary for any further contracts. The parachute successfully deployed and the probe came tumbling down into the waters where it would be picked up by crew and brought back to the center for further review. A great success for the final launch of the year. The team was happy and hopeful that the next year would bring more promise, more success, and furthermore, a new rocket. After the probe splashed down, it was recovered and teams quickly went to work, deciding what to do for the next redesign of the Hornet. Codename Project H. The Hornet 2 should be developed soon. With another successful year under their belts, the team rejoiced as they pushed themselves further to their ultimate goal, putting a man into space and possibly beyond. The X-Plane program will continue even though the mishaps with Kat Nizkin and the destroyed plane. Knowing they need a newer and bigger rocket, team was already start developing the second variation of the Hornet 2. And with that, I'd like to end the episode. I still don't know how to do the outro for these, so we're just going to do it like this. Whoops. Thank you guys again for stopping by. I've been your host, Sonic the Hero Type. If you liked the video, feel free to give it a like, and if you want to see more, you can always subscribe. Also keep in mind that I do hang around on Carnassus Discord, so if you need any help, I'm usually around there, and I do have my How to RP1 series going as well. That's designed to help new players get into RO. So if you're interested or you know a friend who wants to try it, feel free to let them know about those videos. That being said, I'm going to let you guys go. Thanks again for stopping by, and I hope to see you guys next time in the year 1954.